Good morning. Good morning, all the saints, all the angels. Uh, this is Bishop Mark Andrus uh, speaking to you from the Diocese of California and Grace Cathedral. And it is uh, my complete and um, utter honor to welcome our presiding bishop, the Most Reverend Michael Bruce Curry, uh, who is joining us to um, explore the beloved community. Bishop Michael, I wonder if you would do us the honor of leading us in a prayer to open this time together. Sure. Thank you, Bishop. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we, we, your children, come before you on this day, trusting your goodness, your mercy, and your love, your power and might to save and to heal and to help. We ask you to help this, your world. Help us in a time of perplexity and difficulty. Help those who suffer the most. Be with those who are sick, those who are dying, those who are weary. Be with us all, your family, and help us to find our way to live in your love, to bless your creation, to bless each other, and somehow by your grace to become your beloved community. This we ask and pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Michael. Um, this is a forum where the people who are so eager and who love you so much, Bishop Michael, uh, oh. would like to help have you help us explore the beloved community. Um, the late Representative John Lewis uh, probably brought the beloved community in his last words to more people than it, than it hurt it in a very long time. And he linked it to love mm -hmm. and he linked it to nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And he called us all to be loyal to the beloved community. Uh, so I want to just dive in with some questions. Sure. Okay. Well, can I just thank you, though? Thank you yeah. for having me, Bishop Mark. I mean, I, it, you are my buddy and my friend, my violin teacher. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just good to be with you and your whole team and Sheila and all the good people of the diocese. So just thank you for this, brother. Oh, thank you. It, um, we all love you with all our hearts and are so grateful to you. And, and I, as your friend and brother, it's, it's an love honor you guys. to be here. <laughs> Although, it. I will say that um, there's mistakes on the, um, on the PR for this event. It's calling oh. it your visitation to the Diocese of California. And oh, no, right. no, 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 no. That doesn't count, right? Yes, and there's got to be some incarnation, right? Yeah, yeah, some incarnation. We're gonna get you. We're gonna get you back when we can all be together in person. That'd be oh, that'd be wonderful. It really will be. So, um, you told me a long time ago that you wrote your undergraduate thesis mm -hmm. on the Reverend Doctor Martin Luther King Jr. I believe that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And what was the most important thing you learned about him in your research? You know, I mean, I have to admit that there were a couple of things. One was the the thesis was around the question of whether or not nonviolence was um, a tactic um, or was it uh, a way of life that had tactical, strategic and tactical uh, impact. And and it became fairly clear that he really strove uh, for the nonviolent way to become a way of life. He struggled with that. In all honesty, I mean, even in the midst of the, I guess it was the Montgomery bus boycott, he went out and bought a gun um, when his home was threatened. And, you know, the phone, they'd pick up the phone and somebody would threaten to blow him up. Or, or And he actually went out and got a gun. Um, and then he, he eventually disposed of it. He said, I, I can't do this. He struggled with that. Um, and, and I think he came to a realization that it had to be a way of life. Otherwise, it's just another, it runs the risk of being another means of manipulation that won't yield um, 
the beloved community as he eventually would be able to finally claim it. Um, you know, I mean, the reality is you can't get the beloved community except through loving means. <laughs> um, and and uh, he finally realized that, but he struggled with it his whole life because um, he was deeply perplexed by the end of his life and 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 tortured. And so I, I actually saw all of that. It was fascinating to see the idealistic King early on in reading some of his papers um, that he wrote when he was at Boston. I, I went up to Boston um, and they let me see the papers and read his dissertation. And um, I mean, actual papers he wrote for classes, um, handwritten in those days in those little blue books. Um, but to realize this was a way of life. Um, and then I, I tell you, and, and for me, it was kind of a, I mean, not a conversion, maybe a little bit dramatic, but, but it was a turning point for me really beginning to realize that maybe the ordained ministry mm. um, was, was my path for actually helping to make a difference in life and in the world. I mean, and, and really seeing how, King walked through that himself. I mean, through the different stages of his life, um, how he actually walked through and then came to that conclusion himself. Because, you know, he went to um, Montgomery um, originally intending not, he wasn't intending to be, to lead a, a movement. He was going there to write books and, and teach at the university there. And, but he, he found that his real call um, was to lead a movement for change and, and to be a prophet, whether he wanted to or not. Um, and he wasn't particularly keen on it at first. Yeah. Um, and that was a realization. This guy was real. Because I had, you know, it's the funny thing was, I mean, there's the mythic king. I mean, which is always, you know, that that's there, um, it, which is kind of the persona that builds around. But then there's kind of the historical, the human one um, who has to struggle to become, to attain the myth, has to struggle to uh, become more than he would be on his own. And you could actually see it in his papers. Um, it, it was just fascinating to, to see that, which helped me understand, Dr. King helped me understand Jesus. He really did because he, he grasped the core of Jesus of Nazareth, that this way of nonviolent love and existence, that, that it was literally, it's an existence that is transformative of everything. Um, and, you know, we're always works in progress. I mean, you know, there's no, in process, there's no question about that. But that's different than um, simple adherence to a set of mm -hmm. uh, uh, propositional statements. This is about the conversion of a way of life. And I think Thich Nhat Hanh helped him to begin to see how that inner self is slowly getting transformed or can be transformed. Wow until you are um, a, you are nonviolent, you, you are love, um, you are uh, an embodiment of the spirit of the living God who is love. I mean, that's, that's the deeper side that King saw. He learned some of that from Gandhi, some of that from Gandhi, mm -hmm. uh, but I think people like Thich Nhat Hanh, now you would know better than I, helped him to have some frameworks for actually grasping that. Um, well, that's amazing you say that. I, I'll, I'll comment on that briefly, but um, that's so beautiful to me. We've talked so much over the last 18 years that we've known each other. <laughs> yeah. um, and I knew about your undergraduate thesis, but I, I didn't know that connection between grasping that it was a struggle to make it a way of life for King and that connected to your sense of call to the ordained ministry. That's tremendously powerful to me. Mm -hmm. I do think you're right that, that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh did contribute something. King definitely contributed something to Thich Nhat Hanh, the idea of the beloved community. He passed to him in 1967. Um, and just before Thich Nhat Hanh's stroke in, in uh, 2014, he said uh, that he had been loyal all those years to continuing what Martin called the beloved community. And I, I've wondered how, one of the things I've researched was how was he loyal? What did he mean by being loyal to continuing the beloved community? And I think um, he did a lot of outward things, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh in his active life. He started university, he ordained women, he did many things, working for peace in Vietnam, but he also is mostly known for teaching people mindfulness 
Yes. How to go inside and yeah. work on the garden of our souls and yeah. to touch the suffering in our lives and see that to touch the origin of suffering leads to compassion. Yes. Uh, so I, I think, um, I, I don't think he taught King that, but he helped teach King that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, there was, they mutually helped each other. I, I do mm -hmm. think that's true. Um, sticking with your history, uh, I've, okay. I've heard you many times, um, and I've heard you many times draw on black spirituals and hymns mm. as, mm. The, as roots, I would say, or fountainheads of your theology. And you're mm. a truly brilliant theologian. Yeah. And um, you, you got all, everything your teachers gave you at, at YDS, and uh, you, you took it inside and you made it your own. Um, and somehow part of that mix is, is art and the beauty of music and music that particular music that comes through black lives and black struggle. And I wonder if you could talk about that, yeah. the contribution of, of these uh, powerful hymns and spirituals and art in that way yes. to, to the beloved, to, to repairing the beloved community and what it's meant to yes. you. You know, it's funny. I mean, we've talked so much over the years. It's, it's, I, I, I didn't realize um, how much that was that an impact on me until um, it was actually Nancy Bryan at Church Publishing said, have you noticed that you are always quoting hymns and spirituals? And I mean, they, they're all over your sermons. They're all over. Even when you get in a conversation, they pop up. Um, and she says, where is that coming from? And, you know, now I think about it, some of, and I had to think in that book I wrote, songs my grandma sang, came out of that, um, a realization that she was kind of both a, an epicenter of that in, in flesh, but also iconically too. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, there was, I've started to realize both from her, but also when I started studying spirituals that I had grown up hearing and realizing what sounded like very simple songs, in fact, were significantly complex mm -hmm. on a whole lot of levels, um, especially when you contextualize them. Um, I mean, I mean, one that that just still blows me away um, is you know the the one oh freedom oh freedom oh freedom over me and before I'll be a slave I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. If you think about just something that simple, okay, well, that sounds okay. You know, slave wants to go and get free. The thing is, it's a slave, a person who is legally a slave. Um, if they're male, three-fifths of a human for constitutional purposes. Um, if they're female, I guess they're just no, nothing. Um, somebody who is legally a slave, not a human being, not a person, in the eyes of law and society, singing, and before I'll be a slave. I'll be wow. buried in my grave. You see what I mean? That something very simple actually yes. contains a world, a depth of meaning of, oh no, I'm not a slave. You may have my, I may be chained, I may be bound, um, but I'm not a slave until I yield my soul. And only Jesus has my soul. That's what they would, that, that's what they say. That's why they used to sing. And I remember my daddy used to used to make not make fun, but actually kind of people have had issues. There's one spiritual said, "You can have all this world, give me Jesus." And they, the old folks, some of them would say, "Yeah, that's exactly what we got. We got <laughs> Jesus, and everybody else got the world." <laughs> wow! But if well, you dig deeper into deep. realization that that's a claim that reality, as it is constituted, is not ultimate reality, no matter right. how how much it it feels and you've got to live in it. You can't pretend it's not there, but it is not the final word. It is not ultimate reality. And that is, that's to make a claim about reality that can set you free, even in the midst of servitude, even in the midst of hard time. You know, I mean, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrows. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Then all of a sudden they shout, glory, hallelujah. Listen to it, trouble. Glory, hallelujah. And then one of the verses says, nobody knows but Jesus. And it is, you know, Baum and Gilead. I mean, it could go on and on. Baum and Gilead, the Howard Thurman, um, in his book, The Negro Spiritual, speaks of life and death, which is just a classic of, of doing some real theological wrestling with these. 
um, says that Bam and Gilead is the most mind boggling um, of, of all of them because um, you know, they, they're singing about the bomb in Gilead, and they knew the story of, of, of Jeremiah. Um, and, and yet he said the slave did something that hadn't been done before. Jeremiah cried, is there no bomb in Gilead? From his, from his perplexity, his world was falling. I mean, Jeremiah was like, what shall we say? The most unsuccessful prophet in the, in the whole Hebrew scripture. I mean, th this dude had no, you know, if he didn't have bad luck, he wouldn't have had any luck at all. I mean, nothing. For, I mean, he get, they throw him down into the cistern, remember? Um, he eventually, as far as we know, probably dies in exile in Egypt or somewhere. Um, I mean, he's always having to say things that, that the kings and the powers that be don't like. He preaches the temple sermon, which is really great when you read it on paper, but you re realize when he preached it, that's what got him in trouble. I mean, the guy had no luck and he saw, he saw the people he loved and the land he loved destroying themselves in factions, in oppression of the poor, of injustices. He saw them and he kept he cried out, is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no healing? Is there no physician there? And Thurman said, the slaves said, oh, Jeremiah, we understand. But Jeremiah, it's like they called across the centuries. But Jeremiah, Jeremiah, we ran into this guy named Jesus. And oh, there is a bomb in Gilead. Oh, sometimes I feel discouraged and think my life's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. Oh, Jeremiah, listen to us. There is a bomb in Gilead. If you cannot preach like Peter, you cannot pray like Paul. Just tell the love of Jesus how he died to save us all. Oh, there is a bomb. That is metaphysical de defiance against the reality as it is. And that can keep you going. Like the, like the lift every voice says, in days when hope unborn had died. Mm. And that's, I mean, I realized unlettered, untutored people, they grasp, it's like they got the essence of life the and, the, and the reality of God. This, you know, like they used to say, this God who sits on high and looks down low. I mean, they, it's like they got it. Um, and, and nothing but sheer spiritual genius and the Holy Spirit combining, coming out of living life and discovering there is a God in the midst of a, there's like Tillich would say, a ground of being. There is a, it is not just an abyss. There is a ground of being. They discovered it and they were able, they were able to march through hell for a heavenly cause. And I think, I mean, for those of us right now and their spiritual, we are their spiritual heirs. And in the midst of pandemic, I mean, this pandemic we're living in, in the midst of all of our sins of our racial past, all the ghosts are coming out now and for that to be seen in the midst of that. And in the midst of a country that is deeply and profoundly and dangerously divided, um, I mean, dangerously so, um, in all of that, to know that, that there are some folk who lived life a lot worse than we have ever imagined. And they found a way to claim the victory of life in the midst of it. Um, uh, like Job says, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I mean, that is, that's not stoicism. That is a, that is a, that is a faith that can move mountains. And that, Man. Michael, don't you think that that healing is mutual in this ground of being that that um, that as they call across the centuries back to Jeremiah, that that slaves were offering a healing to Jeremiah who yes 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 and it works both ways I think yes um, <laughs> exactly there's a a, a beautiful reality to this God who says, I am the God, not of the dead, but of the living. But he refers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are, in terms of earthly bodies, they're dead right. when, when God says that. But to God, they're all living. And so there's this possibility that is being worked out all the time of, of the dead and the living being in mutual healing relationships with each other. It's the, the communion of saints. I mean, 
um, every time we do Eucharist, therefore with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. I don't know how all that works out. I mean, that's way above my pay grade. I just know that somehow those saints, we are surrounded by that cloud of witnesses yeah. and they were talking to Jeremiah and he was hearing them. I don't know how that works. Yeah, out. So, yeah, exactly. The, the saints as works in progress as well. And, yeah. uh, and that broken us have something to contribute to broken them and light to shed both directions. That, yeah. That's really, really beautiful. Oh. Um, when did you first encounter the phrase beloved community and what did what did it mean to you then and then how do you understand it now and how's your understanding changed over that time i i actually know when i believe it or not i know it was that year i was doing the thesis um ken smith and ira zepp had just published a, it was probably the first real theological study of king of his theology um, it was called, the title of the book was Search for the Beloved Community. I don't even think it's in print now. I've read it. Um, and have you, yeah. And it, it was probably the first, like I said, theological analysis of King. Um, most were historical or biographical um, or, or political science, political philosophy as well. But this one went in and it was, and there was a chapter in there on where the beloved community came from. I'm going back to Josiah Royce and kind of coming through Howard Thurman, actually, mm -hmm. um, to King. It was probably Thurman. Uh, my guess is Thurman was the one who really teed it up for him, although King read uh, Josiah Royce uh, and would have been, a, but it was Thurman that made it, I, I think, think made he it was, alive. I think Thurman was the conduit. Yeah, yeah. So that was the first time I had heard it. I don't remember it having that much of an impression on me, to be honest, then. I, I mean, I, I no, it didn't, I don't remember it. It, I got it. I heard it. It didn't quite resonate. I mean, it didn't click. It was just like filed in the background somewhere. Right. But as time's gone on, and maybe I just had to live some more life or something, uh, I guess. I mean, I've started to realize that, you know, where King says over and over again, we will either learn to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. The choice is ours, chaos or community. Mm -hmm. He's right. There, there, there is a choice, it, chaos or community. I mean, it's the choice God made at the beginning of creation, chaos or creation, <laughs> chaos or community. And the only way to create true community is beloved community in which all are loved and cherished and honored um, and affirmed and recognized as as the children of God made in God's image and likeness and that if that's the case th th then we would lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside and study war no more if that's the case um then everybody's going to get health care I mean we don't we don't make you know somehow we'll figure that we'll get we'll make it happen <laughs> if that's the case you know, nobody gets left behind. I mean, if that's the case, you're talking about a different kind of world here and now that is trying to live out what we pray all the time in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> We've been praying for the beloved, the realization in time of the beloved community that exists in heaven. Um, and, and we're praying and working for that. Over time, that's gotten more real to me. I think, and it's interesting because I would have read this sentence when King, um, this is after the Montgomery bus boycott. Actually, he said it during the boycott. Um, you know, the end is, um, you know, the end, the goal is not the, the just simply eradicating, um, you know, a, a segregation of public transportation facilities. I mean, that's a proximate goal, but that's not the ultimate goal. He said the end or the goal is, is you know, um, reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. I think I've earlier on, I would have said, oh no, the end is to stop the, to get the public transportation. You see what I mean? And I think as the years have gone on, I've realized, well, that's a, that's a step on the way, but that's not the goal. Um, it's, it's, it's heading in the direction. Right. Uh, so you gotta, you gotta change the laws. You gotta change the policies. You gotta do it. 
but each step of the way, but that's not enough. I mean, I, we have to, we have to reimagine policing and law enforcement and criminal justice in this country. And we've got, and there are practical things that have to be done. Yes. They, no, must be done, but that's not the end. We've got to do something to transform hearts and lives. I mean, it's not either or, but, but, but if we don't change hearts and lives, you got to change the conditions that people have to live in, which can help to foster a better way of heart. But if you don't change hearts, you're going to find bounce back all the time. Um, and we got a history of that. You know, Civil War happens. Um, and then after the Civil War, there's Reconstruction. And as long as the Union Army is in the South, I mean, the South were you, I mean, you know, our South, as long as the Union Army was there, um, there was stuff happening. I mean, here in North Carolina and Wilmington, I mean, there were integrated congregations of Black and in the Episcopal Church of Blacks and Whites and literally together and intentionally started that way. There were congressmen and senators, Black congressmen and senators from the South. Um, black folk were voting. I mean, people, schools were starting the Freedmen Bureau and all that stuff. Was, I mean, literally, it was a, a, a dawn of a new new day was beginning to happen and blossom. And then I, I believe it was Rutherford B. Hayes cut that deal in order to get elected president. Remember, the, pre the election got bogged down. Um, you know, anyway, got bogged down. And the deal was he would pull the Union troops out. And as soon as he pulled them out, Jim Crow got up from the grave. And the next thing we know, hooded night riders, and it all went back. Every era of progress has seen a pushback. I mean, and that and that's that's social dynamics. I mean, I I, I know that. But if we can transform hearts, transform minds and lives, I mean, like that the epistle from Philippians was the one that was read in a lot of churches. If they didn't do St. Michael's, um, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ you, Jesus. Yeah. I mean, that way of being and living of unselfish, I mean, that's what King had to struggle to get to. Mm -hmm. That way of living, that's ultimately how you eventually get beloved community. And we won't get the fullness of it here, of course not, but we can sure get as close as we can get here. Yeah. And, and that's, and I think it's just taken me a while, I guess you just have to live long enough to realize you've got to change the law. You've got to change public policy. You've got to make sure that everybody has what they need to eat and to live and that justice is done. But you've also got to change hearts. You have got to, you know, it's like it says in Jeremiah, um, I will take this heart of stone and put a heart of flesh in you. Yes. I, I mean, that's, the, it's got to become a heart of flesh um, because ultimately, well, the heart is deceitful of all things, as Jeremiah said too. <laughs> Ultimately, that pushback can come, and when it comes, it may be even more ferocious than what you thought you had actually overcome. Um, you know, words matter, don't they? What, what words we use make a difference. So I've started just substituting beloved community in the Lord's Prayer for kingdom. Um, oh, yes. Because, you know, you and I don't live in a kingdom, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we had a revolution about that, and we won. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and and you know the king, the the domination language. Yeah, you know it it works its way into us. Anyway, I think it's transformative it, when we um, because you start from the heart out, as you're saying. So if we use if we say, "Thy beloved community, come," we're we're starting to transform ourselves by using that language to, oh. to kind of. Um, yeah, to shift our hearts as we hear that prayer, as we pray that prayer. Um, you are so, right. Thank you for that. <laughs> just, I don't uh, know the folks know this. Mark does this for me all the time. I always thank you for that. Just thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. um, so I like to translate agape as overflowing love um, mm. instead of unconditional love so that it's a positive rather than a Un, yeah. un this, un that. So agape love, what I like to call overflowing love, is central in the geography of the dynamics of the beloved co community. And it's also central in your thought. Uh, the way of love and your new book. Um, yeah. So, and it's in your preaching and it's in your writing. Could you talk about 
the connection between the love that creates the beloved community and the love whose way you're helping the church and the world to embrace and follow. Are, are, how are these alike? How, what's the role of love? Why is it so important to you? You know, when I wrote this last book, I mean, part of it was um, um, the, 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 uh, some, a couple of folk had said, look, where's all this love stuff coming from for you? I mean, they said it more elegantly than that, but yeah. that's what they were saying. Where is this really, and why is it important? Why does it matter? Yes. And so I went back and I really did have to kind of look, you know, you go back and kind of look at your own life and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, not to get schmaltzy about it, but I, I did start to realize that the times when I've seen glimpses of that beloved community have been times um, when, to use the, the cloud of unknowing, when there was an unknowing of self-centeredness and a knowing of a new self, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and that it's been when I've actually been around people who've done that, wow. that I've actually seen it. And, and I mean, I, they're in the book. I mean, but it's, it's like, I mean, I, I mean, one of the profound ones was when my mother got sick. Um, you know, I was in middle school my sister was a little bit younger, you know, and then all of a sudden my, the whole, everything I knew just got, got, the cards got all thrown up in the air. I mean, she had a massive cerebral hemorrhage and then was in the hospital for six months and then they had a nurse in a nursing home in a coma um, for a year. Um, and in that time, um, looking back on it now, kind of from a different angle of vision, um, my sister and I, and my father too, although he was busy, he had to earn a living. He had to, I mean, you know, he was doing, doing, mm -hmm. but we were held up. We knew we were loved. We knew it. Well, we didn't understand why mommy was sick and didn't understand why she died, but we knew we were loved. And, and it came around, but I mean, my cousin Bill, who was getting ready, just coming out of college, was going from Ohio, he lived in Ohio. He moves to Buffalo, teaches in Buffalo so he can babysit because daddy had to go back and forth to New York from Buffalo and all that kind of stuff that mommy was in the hospital in New York. We were in Buffalo. It's an eight hour drive. So daddy would drive up there, come back and then do church and then go back the next week. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Mrs. Bullock, friends of, I mean, family friends, but members of the church. I mean, that's where we stayed when daddy um, was in New York, when he had been in the, those six months while she was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we stayed with them. Ms. Erna Clark uh, picked us up every morning, took us, dropped us off at school, um, picked us up at the end of the school day, and, and then dropped us off back at, at the Bullock house. Um, uh, 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 Grandma was shuttling back and forth with daddy um, back and forth with him. Um, uh, Josie Robbins, who I talk about in the book, I mean, I, all these people, you know, they didn't have to do this. They didn't get paid to do this. I mean, I, I mean, I look at it, I said, wait a minute. Overflowing love. It's overflowing love. Now they were tough. They made us do our homework. They didn't take any nonsense out of us. I mean, they had, they had expectations, but it's like, we knew that was, I just, even though we didn't say it that way, we knew we were surrounded by this it was a community of love and it helped, at least helped me. And I think my sister would say the same thing, navigate mommy dying. I mean, it actually did. I, I mean, I, I remember it. And, and so that was an early experience of the power of love, not to answer all the questions, not to solve all the problems, but to help what the slaves figured out. You can't fix everything, but you can make it through it. That's, and I, it's, so then there are other examples of that. I mean, oh, oh, no. that was a realization to me that I've actually been seeing elements of beloved community. Um, I saw it um, when we were desegregated and, 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 and we had, to, I'll never forget when we were in church. This is an Episcopal church. We we're in church the day before, uh, the Sunday before, I guess we were supposed to go to school and a bunch of us had to go, which meant you had to cross Main Street. It wasn't that far, but when you crossed Main Street, you had you were entering a different world, mm -hmm. um, and so we you know, we crossed Main Street, and, and that Sunday in Sunday school, I, I don't remember the specifics. I just remember them telling us, "You are a representative 
of our people. You are part of a change that we need to make in this country. But remember, it's not just for our sense, not just for us, it's for everybody so that no other child will be a second class citizen in America. That was, now I didn't realize that was on the one hand, a, a pragmatic thing for a social change. That was also saying something about, oh, nobody's supposed to be a second class. Right. You see what I mean? I mean, it was like intimation of beloved community. Oh, there's a-, there's uh, a and, and, and as those remarkable overflowing love people around you and your sister and your mother, your your father, your your mother who was in a coma and your your grandmother, as as all of them were pouring love in a very personal way, you were being invited to, uh, to give your love to the repair of our culture, the repair of our country. And, uh, you know, so that, that's how it, you know, it starts at this personal level and it doesn't ever, you never let go of that, but there's this, this bigger stage. Of, yeah. And you were being invited to take part in that. And you did take part in that. Yeah. By crossing. It's shaped street. how I, yeah, it's shaped. It, it's just shaped everything. I mean, so that it's, you know, I mean, I guess I think this beloved, it's been there. I saw language in King's writings when I looked at them in college. And now the years have gone by, I'm starting to see it more and more. Somebody, I was, I was uh, in a conversation with somebody who said, do you believe that the beloved community, um, well, it, it was John Meacham. Um, he, he had just finished that, the book on, on, on John Lewis. And he said, John Lewis um, believed that the beloved community was, is attainable on earth. He, he, he believed that it was, was attainable on earth. Um, that's and, really and, differs from John Meacham. Right. And Meacham would say, he get, went into an Augustinian thing <laughs> and he said, well, we're, we're fallen. So it's not, yeah. I said, I'm somewhere in between both of you. He said, ah, true Anglican. I said, yeah. <laughs> Because I know the beloved community, I, mean, I know it's real. I know it is in heaven. And I think we can get as close as we can here. And we're gonna be a heck of a lot better off the closer we get to that than to the chaos, the opposite of that. So that I think we can get imitate, Im intimations mm -hmm. and revelations and something close to the fullness of it. Um, but but human sin is real and 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 you know, I mean, that, that's just the reality. Human self-centeredness will always creep in, um, but we can keep it at bay. Um, it's kind of like a dam, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's what they taught us in seminary as um, about the eschaton, the end of all things. It's already and not yet. Not yet. Yes. It's already and not yet, all yes. at the same time. And it's amazing. Yeah. It, is, um, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> let's see um so i'm going to go to something that's you know is very close to my heart uh you've already referred to it um you i think it was at grace cathedral when you came at my invitation about four years ago to preach as part of a um oh, yeah. a conference we had on on climate and environment uh and I think it was there that you first said publicly that the family of God mm -hmm. is the community of all life on the planet, not just yes. the human, yes. not the human community. Could you say more about the beloved community and the community of all life? Yeah. You, you just named it. I mean, that's, I mean, and that was, I hadn't, I mean, until then, until you asked me to come and do that, I had not taken the next step. I knew creation was important. I knew saving the creation was important. I knew we had to stop climate change. I mean, I, I, mean, I knew, again, um, what is the goal? <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, well, well, you got to you know, change the laws. Um, yeah, that's part of it. That's on the way. But that's not, there's a bigger goal. What is the goal is our working toward the fullness. And I, I changed my language from the, the human family of God to the family of God, referring to all life um, and all existence, all, all of creation. And, and I realized, I mean, I, that's when I realized, well, I was just getting to it. 
Um, but obviously, Francis of Assisi had figured that out. I mean, you know, Brother Moon and Sister Sun or whatever, you know, all that stuff in the canticles of creation. Um, and then if you look in the Hebrew scriptures, they're intimations of that, actually. Definitely. They're there. Um, and in some of the canticles that are there in the in-between time, so that it was, it, it's been in the tradition, it's been there. Um, it's there in the, more in the patristic era of, mm -hmm. of Christianity yeah, definitely. in the medieval time. And then the Reformation. That and the Desert happened. Fathers and Mothers. Uh, oh, yeah. They were talking to animals and uh, very yeah. much embedded in the in the networks of life. Uh, that's um, true. And so that realizing that this is, you know, we talk about um, intersectionality. It, it's interconnectedness. Life, it really is. That's, I mean, that's why we can have intersectionality. Yes. Because it is interconnected. It is interconnected. And and you can't you can't mess up part of it and not in some way mess up all of it. Mm -hmm. it it's we are we are we are bound in networks of mutuality. We really are, um, and we are interconnected with this world because the hand of God, the hand that made us, is divine. Made it all. Yes. Yeah. And so I mean. It's like I said, it's been another one of those, and you know, you've helped me. We've had all these, we've talked about this. All, I mean, gosh, a lot. But really seeing that, and then over time, I've I kind of knew about, you know, for example, the impact of um, of of soiling the creation and its impact. Um, that that who gets impacted first? It's 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 not you know it's not me initially. Um, and it's not those who are wealthier than I am. I mean, but I'm privileged. I know that. Um, but but it is uh, where, you know, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, at least in the winter. In the summer, we went down south. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. But in Buffalo, New York, and I remember the toxic um, um, issues around there up in near Niagara Falls. Um, um, I can't remember the name of the company now, but I remember that. That was an early, wait a minute, there's something going on some of this stuff we thought was healing and helpful yes. uh, may have a downside we need to pay attention to. But then uh, to, to remember, I mean, the water, um, mm -hmm. the reality of water up in Michigan, um, um, I mean, it's, they're still struggling with that. The, the reality of water, um, um, the Sioux Nation um, at Standing Rock. Yeah. Um, then to realize the impact of climate change on peoples around the world. I mean, when you remember Bishop Happy from uh, 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 Fiji, um, I mean, I just never forget him, you know, talking about, he said, we know our island's gonna be gone. Yes. We're going to New Zealand. We know that it's gonna, cause the waters are rising. Cause, I mean, they're people, but, but, but my, I mean, you know, the, the coast are gonna uh, disappear or Everywhere. something's gonna happen. I mean, it's just, I mean, God almighty. I mean, what does it take for us to learn? Uh, we've got to do what we can do to stop our damage of the planet and reverse as much as possible because it may heal itself if we if we can stop our intrusive damage. Again, this is not a science scientist talking, but it's just common sense. Um, well, we can see that the earth has remarkable healing powers yes. and they are strong and, and it, it it is partly, as you say, because they come from the same hand of the Creator that you and I do, and um, and if if we just will create a little space, uh, the healing can begin. And people have been noting it with um, COVID nineteen, which is causing so much death and so much suffering. At the same time, here we are talking to each other. Nobody had to get on an airplane. Nobody had to drive in a car, and the earth is getting a little tiny bit of a breather. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we could do more of that intentionally. Yeah. I love when, um, when you say that it all comes from the same, the hand of the creator. Um, I've always loved how the book of Acts presents Paul, and it sounds like rhetoric. You know, he's, yeah. he's preaching on the Areopagus, and it, he's just trying to draw everybody in, but he's saying something true. And he says, are we not all, all offspring of the divine? Yes. And when he says all, I think he means all. <laughs> so 
everybody who's hearing him. So the, the birds and everybody else who's there are, they're all offspring of the divine. And I think you've really been helping the church grasp that. It's, it's a very important thing, I think. Well, you moved um, us forward more than I have. Let me tell you, you, you have helped us to claim it. Oh, that's kind of you. Yeah, to really claim it. Um, well, I want to give you time. There's some beautiful questions that have come in. Oh, but the okay. last one, I've got a whole bunch that I prepared for you. Um, and you've just been blowing my mind with all this, Michael, Bishop Michael. It's so beautiful. Um, but I want you to tell all of us about your new book. About the book? Oh, yeah. About that. I mean, you know. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, you put a lot into this. It's been in production for well over a year, I know, well over maybe a year. two years, and, yeah. and it's new. And tell us all about it. Well, I told you a little bit about it. I mean, but it really was an attempt to actually articulate both where have I experienced love and belovedness and beloved community mm -hmm. um, and um, what the power of that love can be, power in the good sense. Um, to heal and transform and to lift up and to set free. And it's, you know, and I, and it was interesting because the, the y, y, memoir like stuff is, is, is kind of embarrassing one. Cause you feel like, I hope nobody thinks I'm like putting myself on a pedestal or anything. Uh, but uh, and then, then there feels like there's an arrogance in telling your story. Like it's of interest to anybody else. I mean, there's, there's that feeling, but then there's the other realization that if it's reflective, almost like, Augustine's Confessions, um, and there are moments in there where I tell some stories of, of, of shifts in my understanding um, of where I just kind of messed up and was off track, and, and folk, people helped me find a new way, a better way, and mm. kind of emerging kind of, I mean, Revelation may be a little bit more too dramatic, but, but a realization that, you know what, um, you don't know everything. I mean, I now, I mean, I'm not sure I would have said that at 25 when I, 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 I mean, I think I probably should have been presiding bishop when I was first ordained priest at like age 24, 25, because I knew everything then. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I should have been presiding bishop then. Uh, but, you know, at this stage and age, I mean, I realize I am definitely not God. <laughs> thank God. Well, bishop Michael, God you, God. Are, you are a presiding bishop at the right time. You are the presiding bishop when we needed you. Yeah. And I mean that with all my heart. It's the right time. Um, this is a question, presiding bishop, from a friend of Sheila's and mine in Berkeley. And uh, she writes, in the triple pandemic, COVID, racial justice, and climate crisis, I would add a fourth, which is the division of our country um, yeah. and the impending election. What are we learning about the underlying oneness and intersection of these issues and the sheltering in grace, and grace is capitalized there. How do we begin reimagining church? Ooh. And I think that's a question on a lot of people's minds. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I, I mean, I'm, I'm not avoiding it. I no, no, it's a it's a big question. It's a big question. I think you had to start by asking the question, though. Mm -hmm. um, what 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 is church? What's emerging? <laughs> what are we learning in the midst of this? I mean, we're still in it, in the middle of it, so it, some of it's early. But what what are we learning um, about ourselves? I mean, I don't mean as a bad thing. I mean, but what are we learning um, about what matters? And, and how to actually live that out. What are some of the new possibilities that come from those learnings? What are some of the old truths that are still good and durable that, that obviously have gravitas? Um, what, what may be bathwater and not the baby <laughs> that's kind of been unfolded now? And some, I think to ask that question and honestly say, okay, I'm willing to listen to what some of the possibilities are mm. in engaging that question. Just that, that posture. What I fear is, I mean, there's a desire to, I mean, we're not going to go back to January 1, 2020. Um, no, we're not even going to stay where we are now. 
and yeah, I mean, it's gonna, it's evolving, whatever, it's just constantly unfolding and evolving. And, um, so we're not gonna go, but there, there will be a sense, there, will be, there, there may be a desire to rush back to what we were. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's, and, and, and on some level, there's some things that will remain. Some things endure. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but I think everything else changes. <laughs> Faith really, of love endure, Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, love endures. Right, exactly. I mean, so what are the, if we are willing to engage the question of what are we learning? What might we be being called into? Um, what are some of the opportunities that have actually emerged positively so in this time that may be callings into the next time, the, the next phase of our lives. And I think the question, I mean, this is one of those moments where daring to live the questions really does matter. Yes. That's not rhetorical. Because I don't know exactly, I don't know the answers. I just know that the question is, if it is not lived, will revert as much as we can. Yes. To what we were before. We Nurses can't completely do it, but we'll try. <laughs> You know, um, because somehow we have stumbled, we've stumbled into something. Um, you know, again, this isn't perfect, it's better. I mean, I'd rather be sitting, you know, with you and yeah. you, Sheila, and I could go out to dinner somewhere and I know you would take me to a healthy restaurant and, you know, I'd help you look for a pork chop, but I'd but, but be enough. Healthy enough, right? <laughs> Exactly. I mean, that's, I mean, and, and, and that's important, but, but what have we, you know, for example, I mean, you and every one of us has had to think through, I mean, I had to actually stop and think, well, what is my job as presiding bishop when I can't get on airplanes and fly around and, you know, I'm not ordaining new bishops and I'm not doing, a, what is, I mean, what actually, I mean, I actually did think that through. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, I know what my job is. I'm supposed to be a messenger. Mm. So I just need to figure out, okay, I got to, instead of going and carrying that message, I can't quite do that, but okay, get on the computer, figure out, do the best you can. And, you know, and like you and everybody else, we've all tried. I mean, I tried, um, you know, pre doing sermons downstairs in our dining room in the corner because that was a clear wall. <laughs> yeah, right. It was okay, but I felt like I was enslaved. I mean, I couldn't move out of that corner. Then I came up here and sat down and figured, and I felt a little bit better doing this. Now I figured out how to stand up, get the camera further back. Yeah. Uh, they just got me a camera, get the camera further back. And I can feel like myself again. Um, <laughs> and just imagine people and talk to them or something. I mean, it's not perfect, but but I realized that that's my, that's my real job is, is really to, you know, and so do that. Just do it differently. It's not perfect, you know. Find yeah. the heart of it. What's the heart? What's the heart? Yeah. And, and it's been, I think all of us have had to go back and say, you know, what is the heart of this? What's the mm -hmm. core? Um, you know, checking up on people. Yes. Uh, I've seen kind of just this incredible uh, shift in pastoral care in our congregations where I've never seen anything like it, where there's this beautiful partnership between lay leaders and uh, clergy, and they're checking on everybody in the congregations. Yep. And then they, once they did it the first time in March, they went back and they're continuing to do this. And this is a new thing of pastoral care at that kind of everybody level. And yeah, um, yeah so that's happening. Um, here is a, a great question about the sacred ground discussions, uh, the, mm. the Episcopal Church, which you have with Stephanie Spellers and Melanie Mullen and others have engendered for the whole church. I want to tell you there are 10 sacred ground circles here in the, um, mm -hmm. in the diocese and two further ones with clergy in them, besides the clergy who are with their own congregations. Um, so I'm really happy about That's that. Ordinary. Really oh. digging in, digging into sacred ground. Digging into, oh, that was good. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. So the growth, this is the question, the growth of the sacred ground discussion circles in the Episcopal Church is an amazing thing that is helping this person who asked the question wake up to others as a facilitator. 
It has not been an easy thing to facilitate, but very necessary work. Can you comment on this ministry and the impacts that you have seen? I, I've got to tell you, I'm, and I'm, I'm getting it like this, um, but where people are talking about it and talking about, because it, it, well, Katrina Brown was really the genius behind that. Well, um, she is a genius. She, she really is. And, and what she did was create sacred space and i don't know if she was this is my language i'm not i don't know if this is what she was thinking but it's kind of like moses on mount sinai um where i mean i remember some years ago gene robinson preached a sermon this was 30 years ago now but preached a sermon on moses and um uh, god on mount sinai and 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 he said um the reason moses was commanded to take off his shoes was that that God was going to um, reveal Himself? Um, uh, God was going to tell His own story. I, I I I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God, that God was telling His story, oh. and that Moses was going to spell out His story. And that whenever, whenever um, people and God unveil their story, which is unveiling themselves, that's holy ground. I think that's what Katrina, again, I haven't talked to her about that specifically, but I have a feeling that's what her instincts led her to, that if you can create a context where on the one hand, there's learning that's going on, because there's, there there's a story of our culture, but then there are the stories of the people in the room, or, I mean, the people who are participating in it. And as those stories come together, with the great story that we hold, mm. uh, you know, and that that becomes sacred ground. And when I, I I'm when I run into people, I mean, again, I run into them on Zoom. I'm not running into them in the grocery store and stuff. I hear them telling about their stories, about the story of the culture, painful as it can be, <laughs> but but then our own stories and how they intersect with that and how the story of the God revealed in Jesus and the God we know, how those stories all connect. When that happens, it's like, oh my God, this is sacred ground. When I leave here, I gotta go and set somebody free. <laughs> that's, that's the power. And I'm telling you, it's just unbelievable. Um, I kind of got in trouble because I got all excited and um, I, I did this leadership institute and and it was in the talk, and I was telling them about the sacred ground, um, about it. And and Stephanie and them said, um, you you stretched beyond our licenses. I said, oh oh, oh I didn't know. So we'll work it. They'll figure it out. They'll they'll get it fixed. But <laughs> I think but, it's literally an, a definition of uh, of good trouble. And, oh yes, that's good trouble. I think you did well there. Oh yeah, that that's good. <laughs> so the last. One, I know we're we're out of time. Oh, um, really? oh. I think so. But here, uh, a lighthearted one from um, one of uh, the priests in this diocese who I can count on for both profundity and and lightheartedness. I did already. Oh, maybe I haven't. Um, well, yeah, I should I should show you this picture first. We've got a gift for you. Um, from St. Stephen's Arenda, where they make these. Can you see that? Oh, I see it. Yeah. 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 So it's a mask for you from St. Stephen's Arenda that is made um, with cloth that they make bow ties out of with our beloved Episcopal shield on it. I love it. And their rector said this question. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, you'll love this too. Um, there are four gospel writers, and the Buffalo Bills have lost the Super Bowl four times. Can you address this from a theological perspective? <laughs> how, how do the sorrows of Jeremiah compare it to those of Bills fans? <laughs> Blessings from the hometown, and there's a smile at the end of that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I tell you, the nice thing about being a, a lifelong Buffalo Bills fan, I remember when our friend Gail Harris, um, who was, was weeping and moaning when the Patriots lost, uh, this was years ago, and so I called her and I said, Gail, I'm a lifelong Buffalo Bills fan. That makes me an official NFL grief counselor. I can take you through all the stages of grief. 
<laughs> I'll take you through your anger. I'll take you through your bargaining. I'll take, I'll take you through your moment of acceptance, denial, and all that stuff. I can help you because did, I am. Did Bishop, well did Bishop Harris feel very comforted by that? No, not really, because she knew I was happy that the Patriots lost that time. <laughs> Bishop Curry, right. this has been the greatest blessing. I, I've heard you say things that I, I didn't know that gave me new hope and new light. And um, it's just been really beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you for this. And, and to all your folk to, and, and for the angels behind you. It, yeah. Do they know that you tried? To, I couldn't figure out how to do the virtual background. So, um, so folks watching, uh, the, these uh, Rebecca Nessel, who's our wonderful um, events coordinator for Grace Cathedral, was the main architect uh, with, with uh, Alan Jones, the former dean. When I came to, to the diocese and to Grace, uh, Alan had started the forum. And he had three this triptych of three paintings of angels behind him. And uh, I sent a copy of a digital copy of it to Bishop Michael so that we could sort of right. digitally be in front of that. But I didn't send it in time to get it on his virtual background. So we're seeing his study in Raleigh. Uh, right. But these are the, this is what the original forum had behind them. Actually, oh, said, there you go. Hey, the Buffalo Bills, Hope Springs Eternal. <laughs> <laughs> Would you um, give us a, a blessing? to end oh. our time together. Oh. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord our God lift up the light of his wondrous countenance upon you. The blessing of God, Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on you and on us all and on this whole creation this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Bishop Curry, Sheila and I send our love to you and Sharon and all of your family. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this has been a joy to be with all of you. And um, thank you for your questions. I, I didn't get to all of them, but they were all wonderful. And uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>